Hi, this is Charles Jacobs. Welcome to Paradigm Shift. If you think slavery is a thing of the past, then think again. Today, as you watch this, there are more people enslaved on this planet than any time in human history. From India to Indiana, from Sudan to South America, there are an estimated 30 to 35 million people in the world who are forced to work under the threat of violence for little or no pay. They are slaves. Most of us by now have heard of the sex trafficking of women on many continents. Women who fall into the hands of brutes and whose lives are stolen from them. Some of us have even heard of other types of bondage, of, for example, the child carpet weavers who shackled to looms in India from dawn to dusk, from toddlerhood to adolescence, until their hands are too big for the fine work, weave the beautiful and costly rugs that grace our homes. In both these cases, when the slaves are no longer useful, they are released. But the case that comes closest to what we in America know as slavery from our own history is chattel slavery, where a person is the wholly owned property of another for life. Owned like a piece of furniture, a chattel slave can be given as a wedding gift and is inheritable, passed down through his master's estate. Today, we have with us a man who was a slave for 10 years until he escaped. His book, Escape from Slavery, is an underground classic. He is here to tell us what it is like to be in human bondage. Francis Bach was born in, northern, in the northernmost part of southern Sudan, Africa's largest country, near the border that separates the Arab Muslim north from the black, mostly Christian south. When he was born, a civil war had been raging in his country for decades. It was, in fact, an Islamic holy war, a jihad. Arab militia, armed by the Islamist regime in Khartoum, raided African villages, shot the men, and captured the women and children as slaves. Francis was taken as a slave in 1986 when he was seven years old. His life was unalterably transformed. Full disclosure, Francis Bach worked for the American Anti-Slavery Group, an organization that I headed for about 10 years, starting in 1993. He was the face of a modern-day abolitionist movement that freed thousands of slaves. Francis spoke about his life and his movement in churches, synagogues, and on college campuses from coast to coast. Francis, welcome to Paradigm Shift. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start with uh, having you tell us a little bit about where you grew up um, and what it was like being a child in, in South Sudan. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be year and to speak uh, to the world about my experiences. As you perfectly put it, slavery is not something of the past. Uh, as many people may presume that it was abolished in the United States in 1865. In 1996, if you invited me to be here, I would have not come. I was still battling my way to freedom. In the year of 1986, the year that I became a slave and a property of another human being, just breathes, thinks, and spies like me. I was a happy child in my village of Gorian, in southern Sudan then. In my village, I knew people referred to my father or my parents as rich family, because my father earned big farms, and he had cattle. We were living a happy life, a life that I had to miss for the rest of my life until I come to the great country, America. In my village, we used to wake up every morning and sit underneath our big mango tree. 
trying to make cows using mud or clay just to determine how much cows you earn when you become from age 15 and above. So this was, uh, your, your parents were wealthier class. Uh, you lived in a village. Um, you uh, were playing with models of cows to, yes. to pretend how many, to wish how many you would have when you grew up because cows are in fact the way that uh, the Dinka tribe counts wealth. Yes, that's, that is one of the main um, livestock that we depend on. And of course, farming also the most priority thing. But uh, that life um, in the evening of 1986 was taken away from me. When my mother came to me while I was playing with my friend, including my two siblings, sisters, and asked me, Peel, Peel is my African name, uh, could you please go to a market to sell eggs and peanuts? And, and, while, and next to her was a girl called Nibol. Nibol is our neighbor. She's about 16 years old. And Nibol was to be our team leader who was to lead us the younger ones. You and were how old? I was seven years old. Okay. Um, I kind of said no in the first. I didn't want to leave because the game was very interesting. While my friends, I knew they would beat me in my ups and they would make more cows that I would have to work extra tomorrow to catch up. But she came closest to me and said, did you say no? And I immediately withdrew my word, saying, no, I said yes, I'm going to go. Um, I remember my mother came next to me and she hugged me and my two siblings and my friend, I waved to them. That wave and that hug from that day of May, I remember May 15, 1986, is the last day that I never saw my mother and will never see her again, including my sibling, two sisters, and my father. We walk, walk that is about 10 to 20 minutes walk to a marketplace called Nyamlao. Uh, when we got to that marketplace, we also sat underneath a tree because when we say market, it's not like in the West where you have these shopping malls with complex that filled with everything. People got underneath the tree to sell and buy and afterwards they parted. Everybody go where they came from. So we sat underneath the tree while I was sitting there watching and trying to sell what my mother asked me to do, I heard a doll who was sitting next to me talking about smoke. 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 And the, both of them were pointing towards my village. And sometimes being young is one of the disadvantage. I didn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. I thought it was something that have, I have nothing to do with. But that was a real crisis. Soon we left our village. The Ara Murali, or they call them Arab Bagara, or sometime in today's case in our full Western Sudan, referred to as Janjaweed, came right away and stormed my village, killed the men, burned some life within the big huts. And my parents, my two sisters, my mother and father, plus many, many other men and women in the village were killed in a such a horrible um, way, inhuman way that I could not imagine any human being would ever do such a things. So, so wait, let's go back a second. So who were these people who came in and stormed into the village? Who, the Gara, Janduid, who are these people? These are, these are Arab tribes. Arab they, tribes. They call them nomads sometimes. They, have, they are cattle people. And they leave Sudan, the northern Sudan, with the Sudanese government's knowledge by telling them to go raid villages, kill the men, take livestock. All these things are done with impunity because they tell them, you go do all that and whatever that you find there, including people, take them to compensate yourself. And this is how I end up with the same people who raided my village and raided many other villages and killed men and women, march into the marketplace where we were doing business. In that marketplace, 
I remember when we, they, 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 they came closer. Um, and people just realized there was something strange is about to happen. And seeing everybody just trying to seek for exit, but there's no exit because the entire marketplace was sieged. Sieged. Yes. And, and all that we could hear is a loud voice that says, La Wakba, La Wakba. People with swords and with the rifles marching in some on horseback, some on the donkeys, and some are just walking or marching in. Okay. So the context of this is that there is a war against the black, mostly Christian South, by the Arab Muslim North. And as part of this war, they had jihad raids, Allah Akbar, raids on southern villages, and this, and you were caught in the middle of this, and, and to them you were war booty. You were, you were captured, you are the property. Well, yes. So I'm not going to talk much about the history of Sudan, but the people of South Sudan had picked up arms before the British, before Sudan became an independent from British, the, the colony. Uh, since 1955, the people of South Sudan were unhappy with the way the Sudanese government and Egyptians and Tur uh, Turkish and everybody that would colonize us. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've been fighting for our freedom and liberty. And what the Khartoum did at the time is that they refer to us in the South, making the war as religious war. Like Christians using the people of Darfur who were predominantly all black Africans. And because of Islam, they were using them again as us. So, so you were Christian. We were Christians. Your village was a Christian village. Christians and also traditional believers. Traditional animists, believers. You know, because in South Sudan, now we have more Christians than any yeah. other time. So when you were a little boy, you went to church? We went to church. There's a church in Yamlel. It's not an occasionally thing because in South Sudan, we have no proper roads. And everywhere, it is all by footing. Mm -hmm. We don't have transports. So basically, it is not occasionally you go every other Sunday or any other days of worship and special events. But you were, you yeah, were, but you we're are Christians. Christians. Yeah. So take me back to the, to the village where you were selling the, the peanuts and the eggs. The marketplace. The marketplace. Yamlel. And in Yamlel. Mm -hmm. And they came, they stormed the, the, the marketplace. They stormed the market. And what happened to you? Well, when they stormed the market, it's not what happened to me as a person, but what happened to everybody that was there. You see people were shouting and trying to exit, but there were no exits. The next thing that I witnessed, and I always refer to the people who have never experienced such things, to watch the movie that is a very famous movie about Rwanda, the Hotel Rwanda movie. Hotel Rwanda. The Hotel Rwanda movie, yeah. that is exactly the same movie that I was in. Mm -hmm. That was exactly the same movie that everyone else that survived or dead was in. Because we were, after they surrounded us, they began coming closer and closer. They divide themselves, those who are shooting, those who are resisting, those who are actually gathering our livestock, some valuable things, those who are actually also gathering us, the young people, including young women. So it was a already pre-calculated um, rate to just, everybody has a mission. They already divide their, themselves into a particular mission to, to execute. So the, so the, raiders, that the raiders knew what they were doing. Yeah, they so had a plan how to separate people out from yes. livestock, from women. From, yes. yeah. So all of us young boys were gathered together, sat down as a group group of young girls, group of young women, and the livestock are the thing that they want to take with them. In that market, I witnessed many bodies, many bodies laid down. And you look at these people who are on the ground, like they just decided to relax, but they were dead bodies. I seen the blood running like water in small river. I seen the horror of the people in the faces, everybody crying, including the two girls that 
start crying because their mother was shot in front of them. Because the mother resists. She could have been captured and taken with us. But she resists. She was fighting back. And these angry uh, militiamen, they shot her in the head. And her two daughters were crying aloud. And they were taken with us. Until I remember the 12 years old, she was about 12 years old, one of her daughters was shot dead in front of us as a sign to make any of us be quiet because a lot of kids were crying. All of us were horrified. We, we never witnessed such things before. We didn't know as a young people what was really happening and why these people who don't even look like us, who speak in different language, everybody very violent, very angry, we didn't know what to do. Hmm. A lot of us are crying, including myself. But when they shot the girl in the head to stop her from crying, the idea was that you would all be quiet. We all be quiet. And actually, it, it didn't stop there. Her sister continues to cry as well. And what they have done to her was that they have to torture her in front of us also. And torturing you, they do what they call a cross uh, imitation. Cross amputation. Yes. That means you, you will be useless when they take your right arm and your left leg. Imagine how my power left for you and how useful would you be. They do that either you die from pain that you're going through because the and, wounds and will be treated. Yeah, yeah, bleeding. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's how they do it, they, yeah. just to, to scare the children. I've seen, and, and, I've seen pictures of people who are treating uh, the cross uh, amputated. They take, yeah. a, they take an arm from one side and they're like, oh, it's Yes. So who, t who took you? What happened to you? Well, after all of us were taking, um, which is hundreds of kids, they raided another village called Mashar Hadut on our way leaving Nyamlel. In that village, they took many, many other kids also and women. Same thing, taking also livestock, including cows. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the work has been pretty much divided. Each person, so each group is responsible for particular things. So when we left South Sudan border, and now we entered into their border, we crossed what the, we call Kir. Kir Adem is, uh, is a river that separates the south and the north. They call it in the north uh, Bar Arab, Arab River. And we call it Kir. And in this particular area where we crossed, it's called Kir Adem. It's belonged to my area, part of my county, uh, today a county called uh, Northern, I mean, Gok Mashar, uh, Awul North County. So when we got there, they set us down as a group, just as they did when they were gathering us at the marketplace where we were captured. And now they held their own separate meeting while we were being guarded by a few. And after they decided, they, we were actually uh, pretty much disseminated among themselves, like a, like, like a products. You were distributed amongst them. Yeah, we were distributed you know, among everybody else. And I ended up being dragged uh, by this gentleman called Jim Abdullah. Jim Abdullah. Jim Abdullah, who became my master for the next 10 years in captivity. So Jima came and he lifted my hands and I walked with him. And we went and I remember the first impression from which I never forget, and I will never forget, where his wife and two children and his wife, a brother-in-law, is named called Musa. Musa is the leader considered of their tribe a clan, I think the clan, they call it in a tribe, a clan called Walad Gait. Mm -hmm. And Musa is considered to be the most superior man. He's a warrior. So he's the one who designed, and whenever, whatever war he led is always successful. So when I first came there, you know, Hawa, which is Jimma's wife. Hawa. Hawa. And Musa, and had two children, were just standing there. And the next things, while I was asked to sit far away, 
uh, these two young kids come towards me. And I thought, although we do not communicate because of the language barrier, they speak Arabic and I speak Dinka, they would just, like any other kid, to greet me and play with me. But they just come and start peeing on me, mm. spitting on me, and calling me a beat. And that's the word I've been hearing every single day from everybody's mouth, a beat. Until I realized a beat means black slave. A, a beat, beat, a is, beat is, Arabic is an Arabic word for, for black slave. For black slave. Or for slave, in other words. Yeah. So basically, um, I began to develop many questions. And one of the first questions I asked after many, maybe four years after my stay there, is that I asked Jimma one of the day, when he came to me, asking me to take the goats out to, for, 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 we have a, a season where it's completely dry and very hard to get a grass for the, to take the goats to eat enough and also water. You have to stand in the line for two to three days, seven two hours, to make sure that the goats are actually uh, being fed and also being taken to place to get water. Okay. You were there for 10 years. Yes. As a slave. And your job was to watch the goats and watch the cattle. And you did that. I read your book. It's an amazing book. It's absolutely an amazing book. Thank you. Um, I have to say that um, y you know, if you have uh, somebody who's 15 years old, they would love to read it. Somebody who's 50 years old, they would love to read it. And you. And, and you were beaten by them when you made mistakes or even when you didn't make mistakes. You were given um, rotten food by them. And um, I read that um, they, the children kind of were amused when you threw up from the rotten food. You were treated terribly. You tried to escape three times. Um, just tell me now, the last time that you escaped, um, how did you escape and where did you go? Well, after a uh, few years of my stay there with them, I have realized that these people will never appreciate the work that I do for them. I was not surprised to see them having cattle and having goats and having all the other kind of animals because my father too, well known in their area of being wealthy because he has a lot of cattle. But I wasn't the one who actually cared for them because my older brother and other relatives were the one caring for them. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I had to be the one to make sure that all these goats that look almost alike are being cared for me. So when I first ran away, it's after I asked Jimma why they called me a beat and why they nobody loves me. These were two questions that I asked him, and the question why nobody loves me was true because nobody in the house loves me. Mm -hmm. All even kids come in to amuse themselves in the states to to have me also play with them. They only come doing things that will hurt, abuse me, while they, in the return, amuse them. But Juma did not like my questions. He got very angry, he beat me, and he asked me not to ask him again. So I skipped the first time uh, when I turned 8 or 14. Uh, my first attempt was not successful. I didn't know where I was heading to, and I didn't even know who will actually rescue me. Okay, so I read in your book that you tried two times. They beat you and beat you. And after the second time you tried to escape, he threatened you one more time and I'll shoot you. I will kill you. Yes. Somehow, um, you escaped the third time. You made your way, th with the help of some nice Arab uh, truck driver. Yes. Finally, uh, you got to Cairo and... You made it to the United States, and this begins your uh, new life of leading an effort to free slaves in Africa, and that's when you and I met. And um, 
I want to thank you very much for telling part of your story here. Um, I want to uh, congratulate you uh, for having fought for your freedom so hard, risking your life at every moment. And I think uh, maybe the most important thing is for all of us to know that you're still fighting for the liberation of African slaves. You're leading a movement. You're putting together a coalition of those Africans in America who come from Libya, Mauritania, Nigeria, and Sudan uh, to free the slaves of, of Africa, the ones that history have, has left behind. And I just really want to congratulate you, uh, Francis Bach, and I want to tell all our listeners to go, if you'd like to have Francis come and speak to your community, go to Facebook, Francis Bach, you'll find him on Facebook, you can leave him a message. And um, this is a magnificent uh, story of a spirit that is indomitable and lusting for freedom. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Charles. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is Charles Jacobs. Um, I'd like you very much uh, to uh, join me next time on another episode of Paradigm Shift.